First off, I just want to go ahead and thank the One Mind Institute and the Staglin family for inviting me here to speak today. It's a real pleasure, and thank you all for coming. I am a basic molecular biologist. I'm a biochemist, but my lab is very interested in understanding the basic biological mechanisms of mental disorders. And in particular, my lab focuses on substance use disorders, schizophrenia, and major depressive disorder, which is what I'll be talking to you about today. So as you've kind of heard today from other speakers, major depressive disorder, like many neuropsychiatric syndromes, is a highly heterogeneous disorder. It's difficult to diagnose, it's difficult to treat. It is one of the leading causes, if not the leading cause, of disability worldwide. And less than 50% of people actually experience full remission with existing pharmacotherapies. And you have to keep in mind that most of the pharmacotherapies that are around today, things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, these things were developed based on knowledge, uh, serendipitous knowledge from over six decades ago. So it's kind of shocking we haven't developed past that point. Uh, dysregulated brain circuit functions and molecular mechanisms, although we're getting closer to understanding how they may contribute to this disease, are still relatively unknown. And particularly um, interesting for this talk is the fact that better diagnostics are definitely needed so that we can develop better therapeutic interventions, whether that be pharmacotherapies or behavioral interventions. And lastly, I'll, as I'll talk about at the end, there are animal models uh, to model depression that are quite useful and essential to our studies. So many of you are probably familiar, whether you know it or not, with this idea of the monoamine hypothesis of depression. Now, where you've probably heard of this was 15 to 20 years ago when you saw these interesting Zoloft commercials, that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, where you had this little blob that was perpetually under a cloud. And when it took a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, such as Zoloft, all of a sudden this cloud went away. Now, the idea behind how these drugs work is the assumption that there is a chemical imbalance in individuals that have major depressive disorder, where perhaps they're not releasing enough serotonin, for example, from nerve A, to interact with nerve B. And the idea of these drugs is that in one way or another, you will increase that chemical signaling, and that will alleviate depression. Now, the issue with this, and why there's a lot of skepticism behind the monoamine hypothesis of depression, is the fact that most of these antidepressants don't work immediately. So, since they're working on this mechanism, you would expect that they would work immediately, but they don't. Sometimes they take weeks to months for symptomatic alleviation to be shown. So, it's led people to kind of wonder, you know, what could be going on there? Is there something else that's actually causing the depressive phenotypes? So really quickly, I'll just give you a little background on serotonin as well as other monoamines. These are things like dopamine, norepinephrine. So we always think, I think, in the neuroscience field about things like serotonin being neurotransmitters. But the reality is most of your serotonin, almost 90%, is actually produced in the periphery, so mainly in the gastrointestinal tract, and it's involved in a multitude of functions in the periphery. You have about 2% that's actually produced in the brain, and what's produced there is, stays there, so serotonin does not pass the blood-brain barrier. And in the periphery, serotonin does everything from regulating digestion to insulin release to even uh, digit patterning early in development. And of course, in the brain, we think about its involvement in things like mood, reward, uh, and of course, cognition. So what could potentially explain this delayed effect of antidepressants, right? So we know that they can be effective in, you know, 50% or more of people, but how are they doing this? So one idea is that, okay, you give these drugs, it leads to more serotonin release that will then interact with this postsynaptic neuron. This will lead to some incredibly complex series of signaling cascades in this other neuron that ultimately will converge to change the way the genes within that neuron are responding to their environment, whether or not these genes are turning on or turning off or being changed, okay? And that somehow that may lead to functionalities within these cells that leads to the antidepressant response. And I can tell you that we have a multitude of data now from rodent models and human postmortem tissue that suggests that alterations in neuronal and peripheral gene expression are indeed associated with both major depressive disorder and also antidepressant efficacy. Now, one of the ways that this works is through the regulation of the proteins that directly interact with your DNA. In every single cell in your body, your DNA is tightly compacted into the nucleus. How this is achieved is by binding to these proteins called histones. Histones come in four different flavors, histone H3, histone H2A, H2B, uh, and H4. Now, the interesting thing, the cool thing about histones is that they're highly regulatable by the environment. So everything that you do as you sit here listening to me today, you are changing patterns of gene expression in your brain to either learn or disregard what I'm telling you, okay? 
And this works through a multitude of factors that I won't go into, but the main one that we're focused on is the fact that histone proteins can be chemically modified, which means that you can take a chemical substance, right, and actually join it to a protein in what we call a covalent fashion. And there's an enormous amount of literature about how this works. I won't bore you with all the details, but it's very complex. You have enzymes that are putting on these chemical modifications, enzymes that are taking them off, and things that actually bind to them to promote functionality. Now, what's really cool about what we've been doing, I think, is that over the last three years since I've had my lab, we have actually identified a novel set of chemical modifications on histone proteins as well as other proteins, and that is that histone proteins can form these chemical bonds with monoamine neurotransmitters. We're talking serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, histamine. All right? We have shown this is true in vivo. This happens in cellular systems. We have shown that this is an evolutionarily conserved series of modifications. So for example, with the serotonal, histone serotonal mark, it is found in every species where serotonin is being produced. It also has a very interesting pattern of expression throughout the body. So serotonin is made in the brain. We see high levels of the serotonal mark in the brain. It's also made in the gastrointestinal tract. We see high levels of expression in the gut. But what's really interesting here is that we also see pretty high levels in the circulating blood, or these peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells. And quite surprisingly, in the, in the brain, we see a broad distribution of this novel modification. And if anyone wants to know more about it, I'm happy to go into the details uh, after the talk. Now, I won't tell you too much about all of the years of mechanistic work that we've done to try to figure out exactly what they're doing, but the basic idea is that these modifications are actually increasing gene expression, right? They are important for neurodevelopment, they are important for adulthood plasticity. So, of course, the question that I had immediately, coming from kind of a mixed background of biochemistry and behavioral neurobiology, is, okay, we've discovered this new monoamino mark, if you will, now, what about diseases where these monoamines, like serotonin or dopamine, may be fluctuating? Are they changing in these disease models? So in work with Carol Tominga, we were actually able to get the serotonergic neurons from postmortem human brain from individuals that either had major depressive disorder and went untreated at their time of death, or people that at their time of death had been taking antidepressants and had shown symptomatic alleviation. And these are all people taking classical SSRIs like Prozac. What was really striking is that we see that in the brain of these individuals, this novel modification is significantly reduced in those that are depressed. And quite strikingly, it is completely rescued in individuals that were on antidepressants but showed that symptomatic alleviation. So, of course, the next question we have is, well, can we model this in some kind of an organism that's going to be more tractable, more amenable uh, to understanding the mechanisms? And, of course, we're always dealt with this major problem which is that it's incredibly challenging. I actually am stealing this idea from Eric. I saw it in a talk years ago. It was fantastic. But how do you model depression, right? You can't look at them and ask them, are you sad? Are you joyful? Are you feeling shame today? So how do we do this, right? We want to be able to use a tractable system. So the way we do this is we use a particular model called chronic social defeat stress. Now, I won't go into too many details other than to say the idea behind this model is that if you pair two mice together, one that is going to be aggressive and one that is not, that the one that is not is going to receive this aggressive stress over the course of a chronic period of time, say 10 days in this case. And after that period of time, the animals that underwent the stress will show either susceptible phenotypes, which could mean that they don't interact normally with other mice, which they normally would like to do. They don't show pleasure in rewarding substances such as sucrose or rewarding experiences such as sex. And there's also, interestingly, an adaptive population in this model called, that we call resilient um, that we know actually show molecular changes to adapt to this, and they don't show these same deficits. Both susceptible and resilient mice show this anxiety phenotype. So even though you have kind of pro-depressive and non-depressive phenotypes, they both show anxiety. But what's really cool about this chronic social defeat model is that the susceptible animals will respond to classical SSRIs and other antidepressants over chronic treatment regimens and not acute. So this is something we see in humans, this idea that it takes a long time of drug treatment to start to show symptomatic alleviation. And of course, there are individual variability within that response. So in using this model, we first took animals, put them through this particular paradigm, split them into these susceptible and resilient populations, and then actually looked in their brains at our novel histone modification to ask, was it changing in a way that would be similar to what we saw in the humans? And what was really cool is that in the susceptible animals, so these would be your more pro-depressive-like animals, we see a similar reduction in this modification, something that we don't see in the animals that would be considered resilient. 
And what's really cool is that we see this also in the blood of these animals. We see the similar pattern of regulation. And of course, if we manipulate this, we can affect the depressive-like response. So the point of my project, very simply, is to ask three basic questions. One, are these changes that we see in the blood, and particularly in the brain, are they just reflective of the stress experience, or can they predict whether an animal will be pro-depressive or not? Two, can we actually track changes in this modification using very nice quantitative measurements to ask, do they predict antidepressant responses, i.e. behavioral recovery in response to antidepressants? And then lastly, can we take this into a clinical population Working with James Murrow and Scott Russo at Mount Sinai, we are now getting the blood from hundreds of patients, healthy controls, people with major depressive disorder that haven't been treated, and those that are being treated. And the goal is to track and quantify whether or not this novel modification can be used effectively as a biomarker for both disease risk and also antidepressant response. And so on that, I, will, I have lots of people to acknowledge. I won't go through everyone other than say Lorna Farrelly is a spearhead in the serotonin story. Amni al Kashak is doing a lot of the depressive-like work in my lab. Of course, Scott Russo and James Murrow. And then lastly, the funding from the One Mind Institute, which is incredibly helpful, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. <laughs>